नमस्कार वेलकम टू दिस सेशन लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस माई सेल्फ वेरी ब्रीफली आई एम नांदिनी सिन्हा कपूर अ प्रोफेसर विद स्कूल ऑफ इंटर डिसिप्लिनरी एंड ट्रांस डिसिप्लिनरी स्टडी एट इंदिरा गांधी नेशनल ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी टूडे फॉर द नेक्स्ट फ्यू मिनट्स आई एम गोइंग टू स्पीक ऑन सोशल एंड सिविल सोसाइटी मूवमेंट्स फॉर द प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ नेचुरल एनवायरमेंट इन इंडिया विथ रेफरेंस टू द हिस्टोरिकल कॉन्टेक्सट इन इंडिया दिस इज अ पार्ट ऑफ योर ऑन गोइंग ऑनलाइन कोर्स ऑन पी जी डिप्लोमा इन एनवायरमेंट एंड ऑक्यूपेशनल हेल्थ ह्यूमन सिविलाइजेशन एंड ह्यूमन इंटरवेंशन हैव शेप द कॉन्टोर्स ऑफ नेचुरल लैंडस्केप अ नेचुरल एनवायरमेंट फ्रॉम द पेल्यूलिथिक एज दैट इज ओल्ड स्टोन एज टू द मॉडर्न टाइम्स we always have photos of hunting village farming to industrialization archaeological history and anthropological evidences clearly indicate that human civilization shaped the contours of natural environment throughout the centuries from prehistoric times to colonial times society and state have shaped the contours of natural environment for the economic growth and sustainability of a growing indian civilization and state societies the human society act out their living in the prehistoric times that is both in the paleolithic old stone age and middle stone age mesolithic period through hunting and gathering neolithic age or the farming age or as known as in archaeological terms the new stone age witnessed the beginnings of subsistence agricultural activities and emergence of villages as subsistence agriculture expanded into surplus agriculture we witnessed the beginnings of urbanization and emergence of cities the urban society utilized water resources for agrarian expansion to produce surplus production to sustain majority of non agricultural urbanized section society it is important to know that it is the environmental factors which were responsible for the decline of the indus or harappan civilization which is also known as cradle of the indian and south asian civilization what were the natural factors and environmental factors that led to the decline of such a huge urban uh, civilization such as earthquake floods and silting of river indus and its major tributaries It is obvious that overutilization of natural resources without ensuring regeneration of environmental resources played havoc with Indus Valley civilization and was responsible for its decline. Viewers and listeners, you can have a look at reconstructed uh, urbanization of the Harappan society. Here is a photo. Here is the original excavated. city of harappan civilization you can see big craters hole like uh, structures these were granaries very famous the granaries to store grains in the harappan cities yet another view of harappan city now let's come to the mauryan empire in the post harappan period the mauryan empire is known for tapping into natural resources in strengthening its revenue base A detailed study of Ashokan inscriptions and Kautilya's Arthashastra clearly reveal that the Mauryan state expanded agricultural activities into forest and tribal regions to augment their revenue income. Heavy taxation system of the Mauryan encouraged fallow land to be brought under cultivation and peasants were exempted from agricultural taxes for bringing fallow land under cultivation. It is equally interesting that the ancient world was concerned about environmental protection such as measures taken by emperor Ashok in the Mauryan empire in conserving natural resources through afforestation plantation digging of wells ban on the killing of deer and peacocks in royal kitchens on certain days so we have a series of what is called major rock edicts and pillar edicts the inscriptions of emperor ashok maurya in which all these instructions were written in brahmi script and prakrit language very soon i am going to show you some of the images photos of ashokan inscriptions early medieval period of indian history that is 7 to the 13th centuries witnessed processes of state formation and agricultural expansion further 
into hinterland and tribal habitat throughout the subcontinent. It is true that plenty of availability of land did not lead to any social or civil movement as we do not have any documented evidence of environmental movement for early India. However, medieval India witnessed conflicts just like medieval Europe over common resources. What were these common resources, you know, like village uh, grazing land, village agricultural land, village ponds, village water resources, lakes and similar natural resources. Here is an image of Ashokan major rock edict, rock inscriptions written in Brahmi script, as I said, and in Prakrit language. Yet another very nice image of Ashokan inscription. Some of the inscriptions in Northwest Frontier were written in Kharosthi script, not in Brahmi script, in Aramaic script, and even in Greek script because of the population reading and speaking those dialects and not in Brahmi. But in the heartland of the Indian subcontinent, Ashokan inscriptions were written in Brahmi script and mostly they were in Prakrit language. Yet another image. Now we come to the first historically documented social and civil society movement for protection of environmental resources in Indian history and it happened in the medieval period. It is in the third desert of India that the first civil society movement for environmental protection arose, which has been well documented in the historical literature. This is the famous Bishnoi movement of Western Rajasthan founded by Saint or Sant Jamboji in Bikaner in 1453. Bishnois have been in news and in the newspaper also because of an incident in which the Bombay film star Salman Khan and some of his colleagues were involved in killing black buck in the desert of hunting and killing the black bucks, you know, very beautiful uh, local population of deers in the third desert, you know, in Bikanir when they were shooting for a film and uh, he was booked for it. Vishnu movement in medieval Rajasthan. One of the earliest environmental movements in historic India was the Vishnoi movement in medieval Rajasthan. It was founded by a Parma Rajput, Jambuji, in Bikaner. Jambuji was born to a Parma Rajput named Lohat and his Bhati Rajput wife Hansa. An agro-pastoralist, Lohat, received divine message, Akashvani, that a Krishna-like avatar would be born to him to liberate 12 crore human beings. In fact, Jamboji, like infant Krishna, performed miracles and surprised visitors to his home. Vishnu philosophy of conservation of vegetation and movement for environmental protection. Let's have a look at it. The Vishnu movement had a wide following in the desert community of Western Rajasthan in the medieval period. Its philosophical and socio-economic content enjoyed popularity among the local population of Rajputs, Jats and Rabadis or Raikas, that is the caste of camel breeders, because it made a significant difference to their life. Following Vishnui philosophy, Vishnui teachings made significant difference to the local population of Rajputs, Jats and Rabadis or Raikas, that is the camel breeder, breeder caste of Western Rajasthan. The Vishnoi concern for environmental protection ensured improvement in the living conditions of the desert community. The concern assumed significant proportion against the backdrop of the series of famines that struck Bikanir, that hit Bikanir and its surrounding regions. And historically documented great famines were in AD 1450, 1485 and 1490 in western Rajasthan followed by those of 1742, 1747, 1792, 1796, 1804, 1812 to 1816, 1837 to 38, 1866 to 1869, 1890 to 92, famines, series 1898 to 1900, 
1901 to 1902, and 1938-39, Bikani region witnessed yet another series of famines in 1834, 1849, 1860, 1868 to 69, 1889 to 92, and 1899. So you, we can see that historically there are documented series of famines in Western Rajasthan, particularly in Bikani. And the very importance and significance of Vishnuic teaching, they assume importance because of this backdrop of series of these failures of crop, failures of rain, and uh, famines. That's the most important part. The fact that the Vishnuis of Rajasthan and Haryana are a living culture today, despite the recurrent famines, indicates the continuing relevance and contemporary relevance of the Vishnu philosophy and teaching of medieval saints. I have written a long essay in my second book, and the book is called, you can see my name, Namdini Sena Kapoor, written, Tribes, Agro-Pastoralists and Environment in Western India. It's not an edited book, I'm sorry for the typo, but it's a fully written book by myself. Seven to the 20th centuries, published by Manohar Publisher, New Delhi, 2011. If you have time, do get hold of this book and have a look and read the article on the Bishnois. Here is a Bishnoi with its flock of ships in Western Rajasthan. Here is a Bishnoi village, Bishnoi huts with nicely painted motifs on them. Yet another Bishnoi village with nicely painted motifs of plants, flowers on the huts. There is an image of Ganesh, Ganesh Ji, on one of the huts. In the middle hut, you can see. Now let us look at the story of the founder of the Bishnoi movement, Jamboji. Following Jamboji's preachings and teachings, he is one of the most well-known followers, Biloji, another saint, widened the scope for conservation of nature by highlighting the environmental and economic importance of vegetation, particularly the Khejri tree. Khejri tree is known as the lifeline of a desert because Khejri tree can survive in the worst of the worst famine conditions too without water. Let us remember that important point about Khejri tree. The Vishnois were not only inspired to sacrifice their lives, for the protection of cattle, but also for the preservation of trees. Jamboji compared truth and falsity with two types of trees, sweet and salty. Bilhoji narrated the story of Jamboji's disciple Karamni, who sacrificed her life in 1604 for the protection of Kejri trees, the lifeline of the desert as the trees can survive, just now I said, severe drought conditions. Khinwani and Netu are the two other heroes who laid down their lives for saving trees. So there are a lot of stories that abound in the history of the Vishnoi movement in which the local population, the local Rajput population, they laid their lives in saving trees, in saving the trees from failing, from getting them cut by the Rajput soldiers, by the local state soldiers. Here is uh, well-known image, photograph of the founder of Vishnoi movement, Jamboji. You can see the halo uh, surrounding him. Bharti Rajputs are condemned for failing trees and other Jamboji follower, Mote, gave up his life fighting against these Bhattis. Glorification of these martyrs is sought as hero Nitu attains heaven and immortality. Jamboji's seat, Sambarthal, which is near Bikane, is hailed because it abounds in forests and is habited by devout past pastoralists. Jamboji wandered in this forest but never cut any tree for wood. He only picked up the broken twigs to lit fires. Jamboji encouraged his followers to grow mangoes out of thorny desert oaks. Among his miracles, the story of conversion of lime trees into coconut trees continues to be popular among his disciples. When human beings and animals seek shelter in the shadows of trees, they get respite from heat. 
Interestingly, Bilhoji laments that trees shed their leaves as soon as they are surrounded by human beings and animals. So on one hand, we see that the trees give respite from heat through their sheds to the human beings and animals, but uh, as soon as the trees are surrounded by the human beings and animals, they shed their leaves. So something negative starts happening to the trees. This is a clear indication of the Vishnu preference for conservation of vegetation. What are resources in agriculture? Bilhoji popularized conservation of the other skill item of the desert, water. Conservation of water was not only to meet the daily needs of a desert society, but also for agricultural activities. According to Bilhoji, when the rain comes, the cows get green grass to eat and water to drink. Hence, water is the foundation for good quality of milk and not any hymn or mantra. It was imperative to conserve rainwater at the local level, both for drinking purposes and pastoral activities. When it rains, cattle grow up healthy and give plenty of milk. Milch cows graze on green grass that only grows only after rains. Good quality fodder like bagaru and chandelevo grass, also used in kitchens, grow only if it rains. To sanctify the most scarce resource of desert, that is water, water is claimed to be the sacred Banganga of the Puranic traditions in the literature of the Vishnois. The need for generation and conservation of water perhaps was the most important factor in the cultivation of grains for the sustenance of local population. The Vishnu concern for agricultural activities to meet the local requirements is evident in Bilhoji's narrative of the famine of 1542 in Katha Guglaiki. The famine was a terrible, but his the starved population began to migrate elsewhere in search of livelihood. He demanded that the local population promise to save animals and birds and not kill them. If they promised to protect the animal wealth, only then God would remove their difficulties. This is a Vishnoi principle that connects conservation of cattle wealth and agricultural wealth. People doubted Jambuji's claim of the divine generation of food. But Bilhoji writes that whenever Jamboji and wherever Jamboji preached, those places produced more grains, fruits and flowers. That is obvious reasons because of the teachings for regeneration of local resources. In another account, Jamboji is said to have gone, grown a forest accompanied by, gone to a forest accompanied by a purbiya and his camel laden with sacks. The Purviya was delighted to see mounds of grains which Jamboji procured from the forest. The starved population acknowledged this miracle and received grain from Jamboji on every alternate days. Hence Jamboji fed famine struck people with grains and emphasized upon generation of grains through local cultivation and trade with fertile regions like Sindh. Water and good quality agricultural production are inextricably linked with each other and are always reflected in Bilhoji's teachings. Trees which receive plenty of water grow to have large branches and bear fruits and render cool shadows. In Katha Avatar Path, the story of Jamboji's birth, the predominance of pastoral wealth over agricultural activities is clearly evident. Jamuji's father, Parmar Lohat, who cultivated his field and irrigated it with water drawn from a well, had plenty of cows and goats. His agro-pastoral activities are vividly described by Bilhoji. Lohat grazed his cattle and spent money on his animals while procuring grains from the monsoon. Having completed the Bishnoi uh, movement and uh, Bishnoi teachings and philosophy for conservation of natural, local, environmental resources in the desert, third of Western Rajasthan. Now I come to forest policies and tribal land displacement in the British colonial period for the next few minutes. Colonial rule was the first turning point in Indian history that a government claimed a direct proprietary right over the forest. This was not the case in pre-colonial times, including Mughal India. The British state became the conservator of forest when it passed the Indian Forest Act of 1878. 
hundreds of thousands of acres of forest lands that Adivasis had used for centuries and were considered commons suddenly kept in reserve, a practice that continued for the rest of the colonial period. Consequently, revolts among the indigenous population became a routine phenomenon. What do you mean by indigenous population? Particularly, the colonial state intruded into the tribal hinterland in the habitat and mainly the tribal revolts we can see. So, uh, revolts among the indigenous population became a routine phenomenon during colonial period, especially in the 19th century. For instance, the famous ones are do well documented in historical literature, such as 1855, the Santals rebelled, 1868, the Naigdas, in 1873, the Kolis, and 1895, Birsas, led by famous Birsa Munda. This is only a small examples of total number of conflicts. Historians, Ranajit Guha has documented over 110 different colonial era peasant revolts, as well as Catherine Guff records at least 77 such revolts and uprisings since the advent of the British rule. Here are some of the photos of conserved forests, the tiger sanctuaries, you can see tigers and you have deers in the same tiger sanctuaries. This is Jim Corbett Park. British colonial rule in India ushered in a period of intense rebellion among the country's indigenous groups. Most tribal conflicts occurred in the British provinces and many historians have documented how colonial policies gave rise to widespread rural unrest and violence. In the post-independence period, many of the colonial era policies continued to plague the system and were not reformed. Tribal conflicts continued in the form of the Naxalite insurgency. The princely state of Bastar continues to be a major center of tribal conflict in India. Till today we all know that Naxalites uh, operate uh, in the state of Bastar, which is a part of uh, present Chhattisgarh state and uh, they are quite a menace both to local population and to the state. Uh, this is Botanical Garden in uh, Calcutta that the Britishers founded, uh, very, very old uh, trees which have been conserved there. Yet another photo of Botanical Garden. The new colonial policies such as the policing, policing of forest lands and increased rural taxation led to the widespread discontent and rebellion among the indigenous groups. To quote a historian Stokes, resentment against the moneylenders boiled over most readily into violence among tribal people like the Bheels, Santals and the Goons. Historians have shown that in the post-independence era, the new Indian government really did not reform a number of colonial period policies as far as tribal habitat and forest policies are concerned. So the independent government of India did not really make uh, much changes especially those dealing with forestry and tribal conflicts and continue to and tribal conflicts continue to occur throughout the country especially in former areas of direct british rule like bengal bihar and jharkhand tribal revolts began in bastar precisely because of increasing british influence in the state three specific policies these specific policies were implemented in Bastar that gave rise to tribal revolt. Colonial officials took direct control over the forest. They displaced tribals from their land and they interfered into succession to the local royal throne which upset the native population. Bastar led to the rise of the contemporary Naxalite insurgency. It's been already mentioned to you. The case of Bastar reaffirms the role of British colonialism in producing tribal conflict in India by showcasing the effects in areas that never formally came under the ambit of the direct rule of the British colonial period. Uh, here is a book, Boom Kal, The Tribal Revolt in Bastar by H.L. Shukla. Those of you who are interested, a photo of the Gons of Bastar. Despite its remote location, the political and economic development in colonial Bastar led to persistent rebellion and provide important insights for other regions throughout Asia. The British practice of retaining areas of indirect rule within a colony was adopted from India and exported to other colonial territories such as Burma and Malaysia. 
The survey and mapping of India's forests allowed the implementation of scientific management. The dominant paradigm of scientific management was to pursue the maximum sustainable production and management practices were organized around the principle. In deforested areas, commercially valuable species were planted, while in some areas, mixed forests were replaced with marketable monocultures, continuing with the interest of colonial rulers, forest management and its restrictions to access local communities resulted in a steady buildup of forest capital. The forest capital was depleted during the World War I but recreated, but regenerated through the intensive management, but again deforestation occurred during the World War II, this time far beyond its sustained production. An increase of 65% over the war period does not indicate the timber not accounted for, which by all accounts is considerably greater when timber procured from other sources is also considered. Historians Gadgil and Guha point out that as the war proceeded, the area covered by working plants diminished, indicated increased in cutting of forests from the areas not covered with working plants, which would have been unaccountable. Large-scale annexation of Indian forests by colonial state constitute a critical turning point, politically, socially, and ecologically, because of the colonial claim to forests represented an unprecedented expansion of state power and intervention with a simultaneous reduction in local communities' rights. Socially, the traditional patterns of resource use were disrupted by restrictions to local processes. And ecologically, as the forests were undergoing a process of commodification which transformed their nature. State control, which was a critical feature of 1878 Forest Act, also facilitated development of scientific forestry. D. H. Rich Brandes was the first Inspector General of Forest and is considered the founder of modern forestry, indeed often been paid tribute as the father of Indian forestry. One of the first tasks undertaken by the newly formed Forest Department was to survey the map of a forest of India. Forests were demarcated so that the working plans could be formulated. According to 1878 Forest Act, three types of forest were to be designated, reserved, protected and the village. Reserve forests were supposed to be the most commercially valuable and amenable to sustained exploitation. Overall, state control of reserve forests were sought, which meant relinquishment or others' claims and rights. Limited access was granted. Legally, channels to contest the reservation of forests existed, though the rural communities had little experience with legal procedures. Protected forests were similarly state controlled, but some concessions were granted. Protected forests could also be close to fuel, wood collection, and grazing whenever it was considered necessary. The Act also provided for a third designation of forest in the constitution, village forest, and which was not under the control of the colonial government over most of India. The area of forest appropriated by the state in 1878 was 14,000 square miles, which was increased to 81,400 and 3,300 square miles for reserve and protected forest respectively by 1900. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, viewers and listeners for your patient hearing. All the best.